Hello, and welcome to another episode of Code and Pixels podcast. My name is Kelly, and I am joined once again by my awesome co-host, Ada Kunle. Hey, Ada Kunle, who are we talking to today? Hey, Kelly. We're talking with Ben Callahan today. Ben, how are you doing? I'm well. Thanks so much for the invitation. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, let's get into it. Let's talk about a little bit about yourself. Like, can you tell us about Sparkbox and your role? Sure. Yeah, I'm the founder of Sparkbox and started as a computer science guy, was a software engineer for a few years, kind of transitioned into design and then found my passion, which is sort of front-end design and development. So I get to write some code, but also makes things look great and have a good experience for our users. These days, I don't do a lot of that. I focus a lot more on research and do a lot of interviews with folks in the design system space, some consulting, a lot of speaking and writing and that kind of thing. A Sparkbox is about 50 or 60 folks now, all in the U.S., and we help organizations a lot of times with their design systems or with product design development, those kinds of things. Yeah, that's awesome. I feel like you're probably like the OG, like front end designer. I think they used to use the term front end designer, but yeah, that's cool. So since you've been learning more about like Sparkbox overall, like within your time, like working with a bunch of clients, especially around building design systems, what are some of their, their struggles that they, they usually face? Yeah, it's interesting. We do a survey every year where we ask lots of questions of folks doing design system work. And I think the trend I would say is that folks feel, you know, there's a recognition, I think, that the problems they're facing are not the technical ones or the creative ones. You know, it's when you work on a design system, it's unique because you have to interact with every potential subscriber. So there's all these different groups that you have to really kind of hold hands with and kind of become friends with and collaborate with. And that means they all have different perspectives on the work. They all have different subcultures. They all have their own routines and expectations. So the hard part about the systems work is really figuring out how to communicate effectively with all of them, figuring out a process that you know fits with what they need. And so I think it's the people side of systems that I definitely have seen most of our customers are struggling with. Yeah, I think that's always a trend where it's like people first because they're probably the most difficult but interesting things about everything. It's like dealing mm -hmm. with people in different balance and whatnot. That's pretty cool. I'm wondering, like, let's say you get a new client today. Um, what is that like process of like building a design system from start to finish? And also like wondering like how long you usually take and like just kind of how you like work with the client day to day. Yeah. I mean, the, it's interesting because the process, at least for us, changes depending on the needs of our customers. But I will say there is some consistency, which is, you know, like we just said, that the big challenges are usually the people challenges. So we, we know that. So when we first get started, we spend a lot of time getting to know the people. <laughs> I think that's probably the most important first step is just understanding the context in which that design system has to live and breathe and, and sort of operate. So once we have a good feel for who's involved and what they need, we kind of break our, our, all of the work down. If I was just going to be high level, we break all the work down into kind of three things. We're always thinking about the education that's needed because there's still a lot of confusion about what a system is, what a system isn't. You know, I'm not super dogmatic about that. I think as long as your organization agrees on what it is, that's really what's important. So we try to help folks come to that consensus. We do a lot of engagement, meaning if we're going to build a system, we have to make sure that it's valuable for the people who we want to use it. So we do that by understanding their needs and understanding what's important to them. So that's engaging with them to learn what they need. And then the evolution of the system itself, actually building it, you know, design, develop, write docs, you know, define the processes, the assets, all that stuff. That's pretty generic. Because <laughs> it gets so specific and very different, you know, for each, depending on the context, you know. No, I think it's cool. I think you brought up a good point about, like, research. I think that's something that's very lacking, especially internally, because uh, sometimes you're like, I'm building a design system. 
for myself. So I'm just going to build what I want. But I think there's a part of kind of like stress testing and understanding like what your actual users want and then kind of like meeting them there. I'm interested to kind of get your thoughts on like selling design systems, because I know uh, it's often an uphill battle, especially when working in-house. I'm wondering, do you have any tips and tricks to kind of communicate the value of a design system, especially to like executives that are far removed from like what a design system is? Yeah, this is such an important point. You know, you have to sort of get buy-in at those higher levels and you have to get buy-in at, you know, the individual contributor level, right? The system has to, it sort of has to walk that line between both. And so I think oftentimes as designers and developers and, you know, researchers and content folks, we don't, we don't often think a lot about the, the way that we speak to or have to change the way we speak for executives. Uh, I think the biggest lesson for me, because that is a big part of what I've had to do, is just understanding that audience a little better, you know, and understanding the way they think about the problems. I mean, one example would be, you know, we 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 stop talking about design systems as a cost and start talking about them as an investment, right? So yeah, they both a cost and an investment seem similar, right? Like I'm going to spend money for a thing. The 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 difference is that. An investment means there's going to be something I get, it, you know, returns over over time. And so that's, I think, what is important. It also is important to acknowledge that these things don't come for free, right? So there is a cost to them. There is an investment that has to be made. So speaking kind of in those terms is important. What we do is get to know the executives that we think we need buy-in from. In fact, we try to understand which ones are actively against the work, because if we can get to know those folks and kind of change their minds, turn them into an advocate, that, that makes a huge impact on, on, the, on the work. So if we can do that, what we do is we just get to know them, understand what, what's important for them, and then we try to shape our system's work to solve those problems first. So that's a little bit generic, but it's, it's sort of like, how do I tell a story that's going to really you know, vibe with that specific executive? I actually have written a whole piece on how to sell them out on a list of parts. So I can shoot you that uh, for the show notes after, if you'd like. Yeah, I love that. I think uh, that's selling a device that some can be often hard, especially dealing with like in sp specific industry. I'm just wondering, like, what are the typical people that are against like design systems? I have like an idea in my head, but I'm just wondering if, if against, you're going to validate. Against design systems? Yeah, like they're wow. hesitant about like anything around it or. Yeah, it's funny, you know, it's like the, the words that we use, design systems, you know, kind of the implication is it's a design thing. So a lot of times what I see is this, like the folks who are most excited about design systems tend to be designers, right? Because they're like, oh, finally a way to like solve this problem that I've been facing for years. I don't want to have to go figure out the border radius on my buttons again. You know, <laughs> it's like, just give me the, just give me the starting point. What's interesting is that developers have been working more systematically for decades, right? Like that is how, if you just look at CSS and how it works, right? I mean, it is systematic. You, you define a class and then you can reuse that class over and over again. So there's a systematic approach kind of built into the best practices that developers are used to using. So then you have this scenario where designers are finally having the tools to be able to do that, think systematically, and then they go to these developers and they say, look, we have this new idea. It's about systems. And the developer's like, we've been doing that all along. What are you talking about? You know? So you kind of create these weird you know, interactions in that way. So while I also think that front-end developers especially really benefit from this, they depending on how they're approached, it can create some weird tensions there. And then on the other side, sometimes designers or folks who are more on the, you know, sort of intention side in terms of the interface, those folks tend to sometimes be a little nervous about it because they think, well, if you do a system, then what's my job? You know, I, you're doing the design for me. You're limiting my creativity. So there's, I actually don't think that's true at all, but I think that is a myth that's pretty common out there. So Sort of just depends, I think, on where those folks came from, what their experiences have been. But that's the those are kind of the two big use cases I've I've seen. Cool. Yeah, love it, love it. So actually, we're gonna like dive in deeper into your background a bit. I'm just curious, especially like 
you being the founder of Spockbox, can you talk about like your transition of like doing like more of like the front end design and, and kind of how you made a decision of like becoming a founder of an agency? Yeah, I think, you know, my my years as a software engineer right out of college were, you know, I I, I learned a ton, but most of mostly what I learned is about sort of what I didn't want to do <laughs> or almost like the cultures that I didn't want to work in. And so, you know, I took a little bit of a break after four or five years of doing that. I had saved up some money and I was able to kind of just take a few months and really kind of try to figure out what I really wanted to do. So I, I went and studied audio engineering and I was like learning how to, you know, have a recording studio. And, and then I was like doing some video and animation work and I was just kind of experimenting, you know. And what I found in all of that is that I just loved that point of interaction between an actual user and, you know, the software behind an, a, a product. And so that's where I kind of landed on the front end space as something that I really, I really loved. And at that time, you know, web design, sort of the web standards movement was really kind of this thing that was starting to kind of happen from the ground up. And I, I read uh, Jeffrey Zeldman's book on designing with web standards, and it really kind of shifted my whole perspective on, on how this work could be so much more powerful. So that got me excited. I had started a business doing like video and animation and just whatever people would pay me to do. And I did a website for, I think, $500 and our clients st saw that and they were like, we need websites. You know, it was like this time where it was just everybody needed this, you know. <laughs> so um, that sort of started us down the path of really investing in the web and, you know, sharing the things we were learning and writing about those things. And there was just such a neat community at that time of folks blogging and, and all this interaction and comments, you know, it was it was a really fun time. Yeah, that's kind of how I got got rolling there. <laughs> So Ben, you mentioned blogging. I wanted to bring up, you wrote a great article called The Anatomy of a Design System, and we'll link that in the show notes. But what I found in really interesting about it was you've heard of, you know, atomic design, molecules, atoms, but I, I thought your, your article on design systems specifically and how you broke that down into layers was very interesting. Can you talk more about that and how you approached these layers, how did you come up with them and, and kind yeah. of just walk us through some of those points. Yeah, absolutely, Kelly, thank you. Uh, we did two kind of consulting engagements at the end of, uh, I think it's two, two years ago or so, at the end of the year, and they were about three months each kind of running in parallel and these organizations hired us to come in and just to give them sort of an assessment of their design systems. And so we did a bunch of interviews with both places learned a ton. But the big thing that I came away from that with is that there's a lot of people who still just don't really know what a design system is, you know? And more importantly, inside these organizations that have had teams doing design system work for years, dedicated, even those individuals on the systems team didn't agree with each other about what a system is or why they were doing it. So, you know, we're almost a decade into thinking really systematically about the work. And it just kind of shocked me a little bit to, to realize there's still so much, you know, misunderstanding or confusion about it. So I realized that we at Sparkbox, at least hadn't done a good job of putting a stake in the ground for us about what a system is. And so I went on this kind of deep dive journey. I just locked myself away for a couple months and just went and looked at as many design systems as I could. And I got them all, you know, all these notes on each, and I kind of put them out on my, literally on my dining room table. <laughs> and I just was looking for the commonalities, you know, and what I landed with on is what you, you mentioned, uh, Kelly, the article, the anatomy of a design system. And it takes, sort of has two kind of big concepts. There's, there's four layers, starting with foundations and then codifying those design decisions as tokens in the second layer. And then, you know, compiling sort of more complex decisions into what we call core systems as a third layer, and then using those three inner layers to build components. And then each of those layers we think of as having sort of three parts. There's the assets, which are the very tangible things that probably take up space on a drive somewhere, right? Like uh, files and you know code and design assets and all of that. Then there's processes, which really define how the humans doing the systems work interact. And then there's documentation, which is all about why we're doing this, what, what is it, guidelines, instruction, you know, all of that kind of thing that's necessary. So 
all together, that kind of gives a nice, succinct way to think about systems. And it's been really helpful for us as we have conversations with customers to kind of bring them to some clarity for what they want a des their design system to be. I, I love that you touched on those different elements, like the assets, documentation, and processes, a lot of ops thrown in there. That's along right. Along with yeah. you know, what you're trying to deliver. So I was wondering, in, in your article, you mentioned that there are some of those things that go beyond a single layer. And so my question is, how do you have any recommendations or thoughts on how teams can ensure that these things don't fall between the cracks? If we're still focused on these layers, these other elements. So I wanted to get your thoughts on if you had any ideas around it. Do you think it's ops? Do you think it's a role? Yeah, it's so good. I mean, I feel like, you know, systems require lots of different disciplines to be involved. So ops is definitely a big part of that. I'm I'm a little disheartened often when I go read what's what other folks are writing, not always, but sometimes when I when I go read this stuff or see a presentation and all that the author or the speaker mentions is designers and developers, you know. And that's that's really common. It's like almost every article says this system makes it easier for designers to do this and faster for developers to do this. And I think that's great, but that's two, two roles. That's a very narrow view of the potential value a system can offer. So what about your QA folks who are like testing everything? I mean, how invaluable is a system for them? All the things they need right in one place, you know, or your content folks or your researchers or people who are prototyping or, I mean, you name it product owners, all of these folks should find something valuable in the system. And if we, if we think about it in that way, then we're just incorporating the voices of all these other folks. And we can try to understand by that engaging, right? Understanding what they need. We can understand what the system needs to serve them well. So that's kind of, I guess, you know, at a high level, the way I think about that is by involving more, more people with different backgrounds, different voices, different roles, we kind of cover the bases on making sure that we're, we're, we're delivering something important and valuable to each of them. Yes, definitely a huge shout out to all the folks that make design teams successful because I agree a lot of focus on design and engineering, but you mentioned with content, QA, PM, all these different roles are critical yeah. to making sure everything gels together well. So yeah, great point there. So you mentioned what the system serves. So we're serving, you know, that broad community of, of folks at a company. So I wanted to shift our focus to talking about the consistency and flexibility within design systems. Now, yeah. there has been some debate on how rigid a system should or shouldn't be down to the cons consistency of just look and feel or the customization of a feature or a product or a team need or a customer need and et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted to get your take on flexibility, when to break the system or never break the system. Yeah, this is such a can of worms. <laughs> I, I, I'm, this is interesting to me because I think what I've learned is that certain organizations, certain cultures inside of organizations want a more controlling system. They, they maybe have a lot of inconsistency in their experiences, and they think the way to solve that is by creating an inflexible system that controls the, the, the work that a product team generates. And then there's the other scenario where you have sort of designers that really want a lot of flexibility. They want to be able to do anything with a system, right? So there's these extreme sort of ideas about what a system could or should be. And that ends up being this balance, as you, as you called out, between consistency on the output side and flexibility on the sort of product designer developer side. And I actually think we should be fighting for, for both of those. What we should be doing is creating systems that are wildly flexible, but culturally, we have to create a desire for consistency in the output. I, I could take the most restrictive design system in the world. I could give it to a hundred designers and they could build the worst, incons most inconsistent stuff with it, right? Because people will do what people want to do. <laughs> and so the, des the work of a design system team is to change what people want to do. It's to create a culture where we value consistent output so we can serve our users better. So if we can do that culturally and at the same time offer really good flexibility with the system, 
then we're we're serving both of those with the same system. And I think that's really the holy grail for me, you know. I love that you touched on culture. So I guess would you consider culture like guidance and more like patterns versus built in restrictions? Is that kind of what you're Oh, it's tricky. I mean, culture at its core is like sort of the underlying, you know, assumptions and beliefs that individuals have. And then there's sort of the things that are visual about that. Like I, I what I, what do I say, you know, when somebody interacts with me about, about the organization and then the things that we see, like, you know, the benefits we have and whatnot. So that sort of pyramid is like a, you know, that's like, that's not my work. That's an old concept around what culture is. And I think the same thing holds true in the systems work we do. So the underlying assumptions are things like, what are our design principles, you know? And if we actually have alignment on those things, then we're creating a, a culture that that will uh, naturally kind of give us consistency in the things we say and the things that you see and do. So I think it's about finding alignment. When I when I speak about culture at an organization, though, it's like, what what does the organization value, you know? So if the organization values speed more than they value consistency, well, that system is going to be different, right? It's going to be geared towards efficiency. If the if the organization values collaboration more than they value speed, that's going to take longer to deliver, but we'll have consensus, right? So there's lots of different approaches, and none of these are good or bad inherently, but there's there's many approaches to culture. And I think that the system has to sort of like find its place inside the organization's culture and serve those various product teams in their subcultures well. That's the that's the trickiness, you know, that's why it's kind of like a game of chess. <laughs> uh, I, I'm scared because I don't want to know what checkmate means <laughs> in this scenario, but uh, that's yeah. great. Thank you for elaborating. I think culture is something that can be subjective and can be seen differently depending on what type of team you're on. So Thank you for yeah. expanding on that. I want to go back to my team and talk about culture <laughs> some more. Yeah. So that's great. When we talk about, you mentioned growing a system, adapting it, evolving it. Mm -hmm. There are some teams where it's the core team is making all the components, all the updates, the system. And then I'm aware that, you know, the other teams, it's more of a community contribution and you sure. want folks to contribute and, and give back to the system. So different ways to grow a system. I'm wondering, have you noticed a trend and what works, what doesn't work and any tips along contribution, who should be doing it? Yeah. Yeah. I think this comes down to, again, to culture, honestly. If, you're, if your organization is one that values collaboration, then contribution is at its core. It's a really, it's a really collaborative process. You know, it's, it's like, we can work together to take the things that you've done, maybe extending the system and bring those back into the system so other parts of our organization have access to that work. That's wonderful. There are ways to do contribution that aren't, aren't so collaborative, you know, where maybe you, if a product or feature team extends in some way because the system doesn't serve all of their needs, there's a simple process they follow where they take the work they've done, they move it to a new branch or something, and then the systems team has to pick that up and refactor it in. So that's not super collaborative, but that's a way that we can still have contribution and governance in an effective way that values maybe, you know, speed over collaboration. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's about understanding the, the organization's culture and what's needed there. I would say trend-wise, I think there's a movement. I would definitely, I've definitely seen this, that folks are, I think we got really excited about systems and we kind of tried to put everything in them. <laughs> And then the maintenance of that just got so overwhelming that I think a lot of organizations have realized we have to actually trim back what's in the system, right? And we need to offer things that are common. So let's stop trying to make everything fit and let's really be smart about what goes in so that we can be more you know, effective with our time. And so I think in that scenario, if you look at that anatomy diagram, that may mean that you only have a few components, but you've really got solid foundations, tokens, and core systems. Now, at the product domain level, those folks can take that fundamental stuff and build their own components that are very unique to their product. And then when you see the overlap, you know, you, you, you maybe think about bringing those into the core. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the, the movement that I see is less in the system, you know. 
Yeah, I love it. It's like less is more. So, um, yeah. cool. Yeah. So just to close it out, I'm wondering, like, if someone is trying to get into being a design system consultant or maybe have their own agency and whatnot, what is like one of the one piece of advice you would give them? Uh, right. I would say right. Because I think if you, if you want to get better at the craft, you got to be able to articulate the things you're learning. So you don't have to write anything that's like groundbreaking. You know, I, I think about it like this. There's always somebody a little smarter than you. There's always somebody who's maybe a little further behind. And it's kind of like a chain link. You know, you got to share the things you're learning so that the folks can, can learn the next step for them. And then you got to be consuming what folks ahead of you are, are reading and writing, you know? So we all sort of have our role to play in that kind of industry moving, moving towards a better place. So I think writing does that. It also puts you out there. You know, it, it helps folks to see what is it going to be like to work with you. I just think that's been, for me, that's been probably the best decision was to kind of like say, hey, everybody at Sparkbox is going to write. You know, this, this is something that's really important to us. So I would, I would encourage that, I think. Yeah, I love that. It's actually funny for me. Like I actually wanted to get into art and design because I didn't like to write. But now... It's like full circle. So yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm writing a lot now. So cool. Let's say if someone wants to find you, where where are some of the places they could find you on the internet? Sure. You can get to Sparkbox just at sparkbox.com. There's, you know, contact forms and stuff there if you're looking for some help with your system. I'm on Twitter, just Ben Callahan. Same on LinkedIn, same on Mastodon. So you can find me all over the social channels that way bencallahan.com if you're interested to see sort of where I'll be speaking and stuff. We actually have a free next, it's in like a couple of weeks, we have a free uh, webinar on the design system culture stuff, Kelly. So I'll make sure I send you a link. And if you want to come and maybe bring some folks from your team, it's a really good conversation starter for teams like the de design system teams, because it kind of challenges the way you think a little bit about the work. So I'll make sure I get you guys a link to that as well. Cool. Ben, it's been a pleasure. Thanks again for being a guest on our show and thanks for everyone for listening if you want to check out more episodes definitely visit code and pixels.fm we also on twitter and yeah it's been a pleasure yeah thanks for having me